Now let's let's talk a little bit about um, pesticides, uh, which is you know kind of like the second half of that food production unit that we talked about last week. So um, a pest is any organism that is that we don't like is not great. Um, they're for some reason we don't like them. So a pest can be a plant, like a weed, or it can be an animal. Um, so it doesn't necessarily, it's not, not like just a bug or just a weed, it, it can be either one. It's, it's an organism, so it's something that's alive that is basically annoying to your crop or destructive, for some reason we don't like it. Um, agricultural pests are things that eat agricultural crops, and, and one of the things that folks forget is considered agricultural is also these ornamental plants. So like the uh, plant nurseries and things that your parents might go to or you might see on the side of the road that have like you know plants for your yard or whatever um, those or, are ornamental plants and they're grown by someone on purpose um, Dell and so any sort of pest that that feeds on them is also considered an agricultural pest and then a weed um, as far as in a farming sense is something that's with your agricultural crop uh, for light and nutrients so um, it can be um, some sort, it's, they're usually like, um, like uh, this one right here, this is crabgrass. You might have seen this in your yard. Um, this, is, this is a really common weed. Um, it's basically anything that is growing where the crop is that, that's not the crop. Um, that's considered a weed usually. So um, the reason we like to be pest control is um, we want to protect our food our health and, and because it's convenient, okay? Um, we know that uh, the farmers get most, um, the most food possible from their, um, their crops. We wanna make sure that there's a pest, uh, like for example, a mosquito, that's what we're seeing in this picture is a mosquito, um, right? Um, controlling that self like keeps us from getting mosquito-borne illnesses, which by the way, are like the number one killers in the world. So um, a mosquito is actually the most dangerous animal on the planet, not like a snake or whatever. A mosquito actually kills more um, per year or mosquito-borne illnesses anyway. And then convenience. Um, when you go to the grocery store, when your parents go to the grocery store, um, I'm, I'm guilty of this. Um, we go and we look through the produce and we pick the prettiest one and that's the one we wanna take home and we wanna eat. Um, and so, having pretty produce is um, we have to make sure that there's a lot of pest control going on there to make sure that you know the produce isn't getting um, um, it's not affecting the the visual appearance of the produce the pests aren't somehow messing up the produce that way um, and so, um, so pests of some sort destroy about 27 percent that's over of potential agricultural production in the United States. So that's a huge loss of income. I mean, imagine if you had, you know, $100 and someone just took $25 of that. That would, that would be a lot, right? That could buy, I don't know, I, I buy cheap clothes. I could buy like a pair of pants or something. Um, so, you know, it's really important that we, um, for the farmers, at least they feel this way, that they um, use these, um, herbicides and they control these pests because they're losing, you know, over 20, 25% of their income, basically, which is about um, $122 billion loss, billion dollar loss. And, um, you know, if the farmers are losing that money, then a lot of times that loss gets, that um, gets passed on to the consumers. So, you know, it's, it's not just them that are losing money. That's what causes the rise in, um, in food a lot of times is, um, Let's say we, that's why organic produce is more expensive because they don't use a lot of that pest control. So they, they, um, they lose more, um, they have less like viable crop per acre. Um, so there's a few ways to control pests. The, the easiest way um, is chemical treatment because you just spray some sort of chemical on your, um, on your crop and it's supposed to greatly lessen the numbers of pest organisms. One problem is that it's short-term protection, so it's not going to last a really long time. 
And then um, a lot of times these chemicals have highly damaging side effects. So um, you may have heard about the bees, right? Um, we're losing a lot of bee colonies. They think a lot of that is due to pesticides, insecticides specifically. And then you see how the guy in this picture, he's wearing a mask and that sort of thing. Um, the chemicals are dangerous for your health. So then, you know, that's why a lot of times you have to wash your produce before you eat it because you want to make sure you wash off any residue of, of that um, of that pest control. Then we have something called ecological control. This is long lasting protection, so it'll last for a long time. Um, and they basically want to control the co crop based on um, the basis of the pests, the pests, sorry if it sounds like I'm saying pet, the pest life cycle and ecology. So um, it's going to be highly specific um, and it's going to protect people and plants and animals uh, rather than eradicating the animals. So for example, um, ladybugs tend to eat, I don't remember exactly which pest they eat, but they eat a pest. And so a lot of folks, um, farmers will you know, buy ladybugs and spread ladybugs all over their crops. And that um, is like an ecological method because then they're going to eat the um, pest rather than um, you know, spraying chemicals to kill the pests. Um, and then there's something called integrated pest management. And this is when they use all suitable methods. So they may use some chemical methods, they may use some ecological methods. This is going to allow them to um, manage their pest populations long term and also has minimal, minimal environmental impact. So for example, um, they may spray chemicals on one thing that you know, isn't, they can't figure out a way to control ecologically, and then they may also use ladybugs. It just, just kind of depends, but you have to be careful that whatever chemicals you use aren't going to kill, you know, if you're using ladybugs, for example, you're not going to, the chemicals aren't going to kill your ladybugs because then, you know, that's kind of defeats the purpose. So early pesticides, they call them first generation pesticides. These had a lot of toxic heavy metals in them, like lead, arsenic, and mercury. These um, quickly lose their effectiveness and pests become very, very quickly, the pests become resistant to them. So for example, they might kill all but 5% of the pests. Those 5% are now re are resistant to whatever was in that pesticide. So they spray that pesticide again, you know, those 5% are not going to get killed and those 5% are going to reproduce and then that crop, you know, um, more and more and more are going to be resistant. Um, second generation pesticides are usually um, some sort of organic chemistry. They're um, a little safer. They're not, you're not going to have toxic metals like lead and things like that in them, but um, they're still not something you want to like eat. So in the very beginning, um, they always talk about DDT on the um, AP exam. <coughs> it's like the poster child for old pesticides, first generation pesticides. It's known as um, dichloral diphenyl trichloral ethylene. I say that three times fast. Um, they thought it was a magic bullet. It, it basically kills all insects. It seems really non-toxic to humans and mammals. It's really, really cheap. So it seems like this perfect pesticide. It's like the best, right? It, it just it does everything they wanted it to, and, it, and plus it's cheap. I mean, what more could you want? Um, it, it'll kill a lot of insects. It doesn't break down in the environment very easily, so it, it remains for a while. So once you spray it, it's going to stay there for a while. Um, this is the chemical makeup of DDT. You can see that they're actually spraying them on DDT on people, and they would just spray it everywhere because it was just, you know, so it got rid of all the bugs and, um, you know, it lasted for a long time. They would actually, you see in this picture, they're actually spraying people with it, um, straight on the people. Um, the military used the DDT to control body lice. Um, they sprayed it completely over the island of Saipan. Um, which allowed the Marines to defeat dengue fever. And then they were able to go on there and, and um, the Japanese are to feed the Japanese army as well. Um, it controls mosquitoes. And so a lot of countries still use it because the um, danger to malaria and other uh, fatal mosquito-borne illnesses are more, it is more dangerous than the DDT. So they've done a risk assessment and it's, it's better for them to use DDT and kill the mosquitoes, which then kill the then don't spread mosquito-borne illnesses like malaria, than not using the DDT. They sprayed it on forest salt marshes. They just sprayed it everywhere. 
um, the problem about DDT, right, persistent. So that was a good thing, right, because it lasted for a long time and we didn't have to respray it a lot. But um, that's also a con because it's staying in the environment a long time and it is a poison, okay? And so um, DDT would do something called biomagnification in the environment. So um, it would accumulate in um, small amounts that over time may reach toxic levels or it may accumulate in small amounts like herbivore and then a, um, a carnivore would eat that herbivore and then it would have its amount of DDT plus the herbivore's amount of DDT and then whoever ate that carnivore, you know, would then have the herbivore's DDT, the primary um, carnivore's DDT plus its DDT. And so as you went up the food chain, the animals had more and more DDT per creature. Um, which became pretty toxic. And the body has no way to metabolize these compounds. They just stay in your body. And what was happening is, um, especially in birds, is DDT was causing their, um, their eggs to be very, very soft. And so they would just break open really easily or they wouldn't hatch and then they weren't having any birds. And so um, the birds were dying or the baby birds weren't even hatching alive. And so, um, there's a lady called Rachel Carson, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, she actually wrote a book about it, and she, it was called Silent Spring because she said, um, if, if we continued the way we're continuing with these pesticides, um, there could be a time when the spring was silent or um, there's no, you know, there's no uh, birds. And so this is what I was talking about, the bio accumulation will um, tends to compound through the food chain, and then that becomes biomagnification. Okay, so this is an example, a mercury example, where, you know, the water has some mercury in it, the water, so they have a little more mercury, the aquatic insects eat the plankton, so they have, you know, three levels of mercury. The insect eating fish, you know, they have four levels, and by the time it gets to humans, it's going to have a lot of mercury in it. Um, so you can see this is kind of a, a image of DDT exactly, where you're seeing that these these birds, these primary predator birds are having quite a bit of um, DDT in them. The concentration C is huge. So um, some problems with these chemicals um, is that um, we have some pesticide resistance. So, um, you know, the, the animals will quickly become resistant to these pesticides and um, then they're no longer, you know, they, they're no longer killed by the pesticides or affected by the pesticides. So then you're going to get this, what they call a secondary pest outbreak. So the, the ones that weren't killed, remember that 5% we talked about, they will um, multiply and then you're going to have the secondary pest outbreak and you won't be able to kill them with that same pesticide you used before. Um, and then also some adverse environmental, like with the birds, and some human health effects as well. Um, so this is pesticide resistance what I was talking about. Um, so basically, you know, this first generation, this is what you've got going on here. And then after the pesticide application, okay, let's say the red one is the one that is um, resistant to the pesticide. So now we've got a larger concentration of these red ones in the environment. We're going to, um, they're going to have multiplied, we're going to spray, spray the pesticide again. Now we have even more red ones, and then you know it'll it'll get to the point where only the red ones or the resistant ones are left. Um, so this this could be a huge. And you've got this pesticide that you think works really well, and then you've got to abandon it and find some other pesticide. Um, where, for example, if these war bugs that ladybugs like to eat, the ladybugs, it, it, you know, they would eat them regardless of you know, whether they were resistant to a pesticide, so you wouldn't have that resistance issue. Um, so this is the resurgence is when the pest population not only recovers, but then it explodes to higher and more severe levels. And then um, we call that a secondary pest outbreak, where sometimes you have insects that were of no concern um, because the pest used to eat them, um, keep them in control. You got rid of that pest, and now this other insect that you didn't think was a pest now becomes a pest because its predator is gone, right? Um, so then you've got this pest.
pest that you didn't even think you had to worry about now that's now coming and bothering you. Um, and they call this the pesticide treadmill. Um, and when you're attempting to eradicate pests with synthetic chemicals and you're getting this resistance and the secondary pest outbreak, and you're just going over and over and over, um, they call that the pesticide treadmill. Um, and, and basically this chemical approach is assuming that your ecosystem is not changing, which is not really um, realistic. So what are some adverse human effects to these pesticides? Um, we can have pesticide um, residue on our foods that we can be exposed to. Um, we can actually, um, you can buy pesticides right at Home Depot um, for your yard or whatever. Um, and so more than 96,300 people suffered acute poisoning. This is from, you know, a strong dose over a short time um, in the United States in 2007. And then they think that, um, as many as 39 million people may actually get acute poison each year. Um, so here's the silent spring that I was talking about. See, these are this is what the eggs look like with the um, when the birds are um, have too much DDT in their bodies. Uh, basically, if we continue this insecticide use, um, there may be a spring with no birds. There's almost always a question on the AP exam that says like, who wrote Silent Spring or what was the book written by Rachel Carson or something like that. It's like a level one question. It's like almost like a gimme question because you know everybody learns about Silent Spring and AP Environmental. Um, it's meant to be one of those like easy questions. So, um, but there's almost always a question on the multiple choice about Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. Um, her book actually led to the banning of DDT in the United States and other industrialized countries. Um, she's actually credited with starting the environmental movement and the EPA. And sadly enough, she actually died of cancer two years after her book was published. So she never got to see um, DDT get banned or the EPA or like the rise of the environmental movement. She didn't really get to see any of that. So, um, but they, they credit all that to her and her book. Um, so these non-persistent pesticides, these are um, pesticides that don't last a very long time. So for example, DDT is a half-life of 20 years. The non-persistent pesticides break down within just a few weeks. Um, so they like that because, you know, they're not going to last forever. They're going to break down into something harmless relatively quickly. But um, they still can ride the food supply chain from farmer to consumer. So they're still going to, you're still going to want to like wash your food and things like that because they, they still will last that long. Um, and a lot of times these non-persistent pesticides, they don't last very long, but they're very, very potent. So they're far more toxic than DDT and they account for most of our pesticide poisoning. You can see this guy, he's like all covered up. I think I would probably wear even more than that. Um, so now let's talk about the ecological control. We talked about the chemical version and now we're gonna talk about the ecological version. So um, this is you know, where we want to somehow manipulate the ecology um, so we're protecting um, our crops without jeopardizing the environment and human health, right? If you um, are using ladybugs for um, controlling your pests, you know, and you're eating an apple that was controlled, the pests were controlled with a ladybug population, you don't have to wash your apple, right? Because it was just, it was just ladybugs. And if you don't have a ladybug on your apple, then you're good. Um, so there's four different types of controls, cultural, natural enemies, genetic, and then um, natural chemicals, which is not you know, the pesticides that we'd been talking about earlier. Um, so cultural control is just um, like, for example, monitoring the height of your grass. So for example, like your yard or something like that, you're gonna have a lot less pests and bugs and things like that in your yard if you have your yard short, as opposed to really high waist high grass. Um, plowing or burning under fields, so there's nowhere for these pests to go. Rotating your crops, so the pest, you know, if you rotate your crops and, for example, the pest only likes one of those crops, then it may not survive through the rotation. Um, put cultivated strips in between your uncultivated ones, and then a lot of times the, um, the pest will hang out in the uncultivated strips rather than the cultivated strips. Um, just keeping pests out of your country, right? Um, not allowing them to be imported into your country. And then disposing of sewage and avoiding unsafe drinking water. All of those are cultural control, just broad measures that we can do to kind of control pests. 
um, than some natural enemies. For example, you can find an organism that will eat the target species without attacking other useful species, right? So if, for example, your ladybug is eating a useful species, then it's not so um, it's not so good at controlling pests, right? Because then it may eat the good thing, the good bugs, rather than the bad bugs. Um, so the first step is protecting the natural enemies that already exist, um, which would then, um, and the best way to do this is um, eliminating or restricting broad spectrum pesticides, pesticides that you know kill a wide variety of insects instead of a specific family or group or something like that. Um, that's the best way because then you've already got those predators there. Um, genetic control is basically this is like GM um, genetically modified organisms where you're going to develop genetic traits in the crop plant or the host species that provide resistance to attack somehow. So you can see that these um, both of these plants were exposed to the same um, pest, whatever it was. It looks like it's maybe like a fungus or something. And um, the one on the right, you know, was resistant. Then you can do something called barrier control. So a uh, chemical produced by the plant we want to protect. protect. So for example, um, you can pick chemicals that are toxic to the pest. Um, and that way you're only going to kill the pest instead of, you know, the good things. And then you can actually have like physical barriers, structural things that will impede attack. Uh, by the pest. So, for example, like a um, mosquito net would be a physical barrier that would protect people from the pest, which is the mosquito. And then um, we have control methods. The sterile males, I think, is a really funny but neat way to do it. Uh, basically, they, they flood the population with sterile males. So, for example, they may um, release, say you're doing mosquitoes, you would release 100 sterile males for every male in the mosquito population. And so basically, um, the female mosquitoes then, they have like a 100 to 1 likelihood of um, mating with a male that is sterile. And so their eggs are, you know, useful, useless, they won't hatch, nothing like that. And so the population just kind of naturally goes down by, um, the females continually mating with these sterile males. Um, and this has actually saved billions of dollars. Um, I just, for some reason, it's just funny to me. Um, and then we have natural chemical control. So, for example, there are hormones and pheromones. So, um, some organisms produce hormones that control developmental processes and metabolic, met metabolic function. So, you could spray a hormone somewhere that may um, cause the pest to stay away or not made or something like that. And then you can also do pheromones. I've seen they actually have something called pheromone traps where, um, so pheromones are usually secreted by the female or the male and they attract the other sex. So then um, the bug, the other sex will want to come mate with them and it kind of lets um, them know where, where they are. So they make pheromone traps and they'll actually take the pheromone and put it in the trap um, and that way the, the opposite sex is going to be attracted to that trap rather than um, the actual, um, it'll either overpower the other insects in there that are actually releasing pheromones so they can't find them to mate, or they'll go in the trap and get stuck thinking that they'll be able to mate in the trap with whoever's releasing the pheromone. Um, So this is our talking about a pheromone lure. And then um, then the confusion where they disperse the pheromone everywhere and then the males can't find the females and then they can't mate. Um, so basically there's there's a pressure somewhere. We can't just say, okay, just ban all pesticides, right? Or um, because there's there's source for pesticide to, to use pesticides. Basically, there's an economic threshold when the damage that it's being done by the pest considerably outweighs the cost of applying the pesticide they're gonna do they're gonna use a pesticide because they're losing so much money it's making their crop unprofitable um, and so that they have to spray pesticide or do something to control the pest because they're they're gonna lose too much money um, and so now they have some types of what they call unnecessary spraying um, 
there's something called insurance spraying where they actually spray to prevent losses. So they say, I bet a pest will show up at some point, so I'm just gonna go ahead and spray just in case. Um, I actually dated a boy in high school who worked for a farmer and he would go to their fields and he would kind of go to random spots in the field and kind of count how many pest bugs he saw in the field to kind of give the um, farmer, to let the farmer know where he should spray. So this farmer was trying to avoid spraying everywhere um, like an insurance spring. So he would um, he would give him the numbers and the farmer would decide how and when he wanted to spray based on the numbers. Um, and then there's cosmetic spraying. So pests that harm the outward appearance. So like this, you know, um, unfortunately, I'm not going to lie. If I saw a bell pepper that looked like the right in the store and I saw bell peppers that looked like the left in the store, I would pick the left ones, right? To um, to take home to my family to eat. It's entirely possible that the one on the right, that those cosmetic um, blemishes have nothing to do with the, um, you know, the health or the, um, a, you know, ability to eat it. It's not going to affect its nutrient value. Um, but, you know, if I have the choice between the two, I'm going to pick the pretty one. And that's what most consumers do. And so that's why a lot of farmers want their produce to be beautiful. Because, you know, if so, if they if they have a consumer has a choice, they're going to pick the more beautiful um, crop over the, um, the blemished one. Um, so here's the integrated pest management, the field scout. That's basically what um, my boyfriend was. He was identifying and monitored pest populations. Um, so IPM is really beneficial economically to farmers, but a lot of them are like, oh, pesticides, what we've been doing, we've always been doing, so we'll just keep doing it. Um, and then uh, one of the things they talk about implementing is this pest loss insurance. And basically, um, it will pay the farmer in the event of a loss due to pets. It will say, you know, you've got this insurance, we will pay you for your crop, even though you lost it. And that can really prevent that insurance spraying that, well, I think a pest may show up, so I'll just go ahead and spray. Um, so it's it's helpful ecologically, but um, economically, you know, this pest loss insurance costs money. It costs someone money. Um, the, the FIFRA or the FIFRA, this is one of our common um, or one of the um, piece of legislation that you should probably be familiar with. And it basically requires manufacturers to register their pesticides um, with the EPA. And the EPA will then um, decide whether the product causes unreasonable or adverse effects and they can restrict or ban the, um, the insecticide, fungicide, and rodenticide. Um, and then we have a FFDCA, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, there's something called a Delaney Clause, and it says um, if a, um, a food or something that's in food, if it's found that it can be caused, it can cause cancer when eaten by a man or an animal, it's, it, it can't be found safe. And so this is pretty highly controversial because if there's even one instance of cancer, it, you know, it's subject to the Delaney Clause. And so some folks are like, well, you know, how do we know it was caused by that? You know, just one really. Um, and so um, if the pesticide has any risk of cancer, there can be no residue on the food whatsoever. And so that's obviously very expensive um, for whoever's in charge of that. And then um, the Food Quality Protection Act, and this is basically making sure that there's no harm in your food. And then they give special considerations to young children so, um, for example, um, they regulate milk pretty heavily because they know that small ch children tend to drink a lot of milk. Um, and so milk is regulated heavier than something else because they're, they're worried about small kids and small kids are small. And so it doesn't take much to um, have a reaction or to you know, poison a small child because they are so small. Um, and they say that you can only have no more than one case of cancer per million people. And they have to um, identify all possible sources of exposure. So not just on your food, 
you know, if you, I don't know, drive by the farm that's using it or whatever, they have to, they have to look at all sources of exposure. So, um, but this one is really, it's going to help kids. Um, so these three, these three acts are the most important sources of legislation uh, for children, at least, or, or I mean, um, for this food production slash pesticide unit. 